This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Today, Liz Wolf and I are joined by Peter Meyer, a former Republican representative for Michigan's 3rd Congressional District, which is a position once held by Justin Amash, the Republican turned libertarian congressman. Meyer's now running for an open Senate seat in Michigan, soon to be vacated by Democrat Debbie Stabenow. Uh, And we want to talk with him about his run since he was one of several Republicans ousted after voting to impeach Trump. And we want to know what it's like running as that kind of Republican in the year 2024, among other things. Peter, thank you for joining us. I appreciate you guys having me on. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, we'll start with your your campaign announcement where you say that uh, we're in dark and uncertain times, but that we need bold leaders to usher in another great American century. Uh, tell us more about what you see as the darkness of this moment and what you think it will take to escape that. Yeah, I mean, I think if we look around the world, we look at our, our the not necessarily the effects of U.S. foreign policy, but the effects of a, a, a United States that seems to have receded um, and, you know, the, I mean, terrorists and authoritarians that have kind of seized that moment, um, the the barbarism that we saw that Hamas, uh, you know, conducted against uh, Israeli civilians uh, and military personnel on October 7th. We have, you know, the continuing grinding conflict in the Ukraine. We have the, the Houthis threatening to shut down uh, and, and succeeding and, and at least discouraging a lot of international maritime transit. Um, I, mean, I mean, even Pakistan bombing Iran, right? Uh, like we're in a position where everything seems far less certain, uh, where we don't know what's going to happen, where events could easily spiral out of control. And then you look at a home front where, I mean, some of the economic indicators are more positive than they were a year ago. Um, but in the minds of average Americans, they're still thinking back to where their expectations were for how much they were going to pay for their mortgage, right? And if you have an adjustable rate mortgage, interest rate increases have led that to double. Uh, you know, the in effects of inflation and some supply chain uncertainties have continued to see elevated grocery prices. That's something that's very near to my heart coming from a family grocery chain and our family's background. And that's before you get to those you know, significant drivers of cost of living challenges that have remained elevated, you know, housing, healthcare, education, you know, it feels like in all of those indicators, American families that I talk to, families in Michigan, they just, they feel uncertain about what the future is going to bring. Younger families are those who want to start one are, are nervous about how they're going to be able to make ends meet and also support, you know, raising children. And so the, when I say dark and uncertain times, it's just a feeling that the stability, the foundation that many people had relied upon, that maybe they had grown up feeling, uh, that that isn't there anymore, right? When I talk about you know a new, a second great American century, you know how do we get to a point where by 2050 we again feel that the United States, you know, is not just a superpower on paper, but we feel that sense of forward momentum that we have policies at the federal level and we have government officials that care a lot more about what the results of their policies are going to be, you know, than just the simple fact of claiming credit. And, and again, to be able to look at, at, you know, objective demonstrable policy outcomes in a clear and rational way, um, rather than, you know, we're, we're in the week after the uh, Senate um, supplemental, which included this kind of grand, um, you know, border slash immigration reform compromise, you know, feel like there's, there is, there's an ability for our governing officials to get down to brass tacks, but also to be held accountable for the outcomes of their policy, uh, rather than everything becoming a blame game perpetually. I mean, I spent two years in Washington. Um, that is not a lot of time, but it was enough time for me to realize and understand that all the problems I saw from the outside, I wasn't wrong. And recognizing those problems, but so many problems are the consequence of other problems that you need to, you know, kind of peel back the layers of the onion of dysfunction in Washington in order to figure out how do we get down to some core governing principles? How do we not just get in the position of playing whack-a-mole when we have all these events that come up and make us feel like we're lurching from crisis to crisis? 
you know, there's always going to be areas of disagreement. There's always going to be division. That's the reality of politics. But my God, we should be able to agree that, you know, crime is bad. So what are the policies that promote, uh, you know, safer communities? Mm-hmm. You know, we want to have a strong national defense. You know, how do we do that in the most cost effective way? And what should our international engagements be that play to our strengths rather than promote weaknesses, as I think a lot of our post 9 11 um, kind of military adventurism ended up ultimately doing? And, and what is it that we want to see the US's role in the world be? And how do we make sure that, you know, we're continuing to build on the areas of kind of core agreement? So what? I'm running for Senate because of that desire to not only put, you know, family concerns first, you know, an outcome oriented mentality, uh, but also to make sure that that is not just a flash in the pan idea. It's not just, oh, this is an easy talking point. But let's have a real conversation about the systemic ways that we can address this because I'm I'm someone who enjoys the difficult art of understanding complex systems and how to improve them, not somebody who, you know, feels a high going on, you know, a cable news show or or having a tweet, you know, go viral. I mean, the the dopamine addiction that I think has permeated our society has permeated our politics. Uh, and that's how we are left in those dark and uncertain times. That's a good way of putting it. Um, the dopamine addiction uh, permeating our politics. I think that that's pretty true. The thing that I do want to push back on is like, are we actually in exceptionally bad times? You just talked about the post 9-11 period and our military adventurism then and the sort of uncertain foreign policy situation of the early and mid aughts. And then I'm also thinking about the late 70s and early 80s as a time of extraordinary inflation, where many of the same things you were talking about in terms of it being very difficult to uh, afford a decent life today. I mean, families dealt with that then too. So are we really in uniquely bad times right now? I would say for the modern moment, uh, it, I think there's a feeling of uncertainty that is that we probably haven't experienced this millennium since um, maybe the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, you know, just that uh, the amount of sectors that have been that are, are struggling and the amount of uncertainty going forward. Now, to your point, and this is where, especially on the political violence front, I am you know quick to emphasize in the 1970s. I mean, you had hundreds of pipe bombs going off a year. You had you know domestic violence coming from you know groups across the political spectrum. Uh, the 1960s saw periods of you know, intense social upheaval and unrest, you know, assassination of a, a sitting president, of a leading presidential figure, of a, you know, the, the leading civil rights figure of our time. This is not the worst time that the United States has been in, right? I, I don't want to be a Cassandra around that. It's the fact that a lot of our challenges we're dealing with, in my view, are far more manageable. And so if they're more manageable, then we don't have a good excuse to just shrug away from them or take a path of minimal discomfort, um, you know, rather than being disciplined and diligent and focusing on them. So I, I don't want to come across as pessimistic, but at the same time, the feeling I get when I talk to people, the the concern, that sense of unease. Again, it's not it's not fear, it's not paranoia, it's not you know terror. Right? We've had moments of of extreme, profound you know fear in this country. That immediate post 9-11 moment. You know, it's just a sense of I, I want to feel hope again that we're on a good trajectory. And it feels like everywhere I look, I don't see something that gives me a reason to hope. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I do want to pivot a little bit and ask you just before we get any deeper into this interview, is it weird running against Justin Amash? I mean, I think to a lot of libertarians, it feels like mom and dad are fighting <laughs> or very well may soon be fighting. Uh, how are you yeah, looking? Let's at be this? clear. He's uh, he's has not he's, announced he's officially running for Senate. But but, he's launching uh, an exploratory tweet, committee, which yes, sure he's sounds launching like an exploratory committee. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. Is it weird? <laughs> I, I, I certainly, um, you know, I for the reader's awareness, you know, I fo- or listener's awareness, I followed uh, or succeeded Justin Amash. You know, he was in Congress. Uh, he had uh, left the Republican Party. He uh, was, you know, officially you know, independent slash libertarian. Uh, during his final term or the latter half of his final term in office. Um, uh, you know, I, I've, I've known Justin for a while. I you know, solicited his, you know, kind of feedback and, and thoughts on on legislation because I think he's a very thoughtful individual. Um, again, that doesn't mean I you know, agreed with every kind of comment or 
um, or suggestion, but I think he's somebody who thinks deeply about issues and that is very much a rarity in our political process. Um, I, I'm not sure what he's going to do, you know, or whether or not that exploratory committee will turn into an actual finding, filing. Um, but uh, uh, generally speaking, I think the more folks who are engaged in our politics and, and putting forward, you know, thoughtful, principled ideas um, is a good one. So I, I'm. You, you know, Did he you give you a heads up in advance, though? Like, were you shocked by this, or were you sort of aware that this was happening? I, you know, I don't want to get into any kind of private conversations, apart from just, you know, the way in which a former, um, you know, member of Congress and a current one in the same district might, you know, kind of, um, yeah, look um, at overall. I mean, you, you both, you both held that same district seat, and you both are kind of out of step, maybe in slightly different ways, uh, with the modern Republican Party. Is there something strange or about the district to which you were elected uh, that made it possible for both you and Amash to hold that seat? I think a lot of people commented, you know, there must be something, you know, in the water in, in West Michigan. We have a fantastic water filtration facility that takes it directly from Lake Michigan uh, near Grand Haven. Uh, you know, mm. this was Lower a district. Fluoride that, levels. <laughs> we were the first day to fluoridate our water supply in 1946. Um, used to be so a fantastic level. tooth yeah. statue in, in Grand Rapids that moved it to a less permanent <laughs> location. Um, but you know, Gerald R. Ford represented this district. Um, you know, prior to being elevated to the vice presidency, uh, you know, before Justin, it was you know Vern Ehlers and, and Paul Henry. There were a number of officials who had represented it. Who, you know, I think were uh, independent-minded in their own way. Um, and so I think it's, you know, very much a, a close knit community, West Michigan, you know, it can be accused on the outside of being a little insular, um, but it's also, you know, oh, it's a wonderful place. It's home. Um, so perhaps there's something in the water, but I think it's, you know, better to have you know, members who are in office and then maybe are looking at things, not just through, not just following the crowd. I mean, that's the easiest thing to do in Washington is to look up at the board and say, where's everyone else in my party going? And, you know, I'll just follow their lead. Um, mm. I can say from experience, and I'm sure you know Justin would say the same thing. Uh, it is far more difficult to say, okay, how do I approach this issue in a consistent way that can be defensible, you know, rather than the inherent, you know, reactionary polarization that you'll usually see. Um, you were, you know, for uh, taking that approach, you were unceremoniously booted out of your congressional seat after there was a little Trump bit of ceremony to it, but <laughs> okay, okay, uh, so semi ceremoniously. <laughs> booted out uh, after Trump backed your primary challenger in 2022, seemingly as retribution for your vote against him in the impeachment proceedings, um, which we'll talk more about later. But uh, you gave a really interesting farewell speech in the House that I want to play a little bit of because it lays out some of what you were alluding to earlier about your view of the current state of our government. Um, and I also think it raises what I consider to be one of the most important political issues of our time. So let's roll that excerpt from your 2022 farewell address to Congress. I rise today for the last time as a member of the 117th Congress. I do not seek to dwell on the circumstances of my departure, although it does bring to mind a few lines from Yates's second coming. The best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Perhaps it takes a cataclysm like World War I to capture the naked and malevolent cynicism of our politics. Yates also well captured the harrowing consequence of elite ineptitude that precipitated the slaughter of tens of millions. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. I read and reread those words while flying out of Hamid Karzai International Airport last August during the shameful end to 20 years of America's war <clears throat> in Afghanistan. What I saw on the ground during that waking nightmare exemplified some of the best of the American men and women in uniform, but it also reflected the haplessness and incompetency of American policymaking. The failure of our war in Afghanistan, a failure abetted by decades of Congress's lax oversight of the president and his Department of Defense. To solve this, I pushed for Congress to take back its war powers, to take back that constitutional responsibility. But even when it comes to Congress asserting its own prerogative, this body has shown itself unwilling to do its job. 
the current budget negotiations taking place on the other side of the rotunda also show a Congress unwilling to confront the very basic task of passing a budget on time. The last time we had a budget passed before the fiscal year started, I was in second grade. When Congress is incapable of solving problems of its own making, how can the American people have any faith that we can tackle the problems arising from the broader world? What hope do we have of outcompeting China, of winning this coming century, if we can't even get out of a mess of our own making? We need the best to regain their convictions, to set an example of what clear-eyed leadership looks like both at home and abroad. We need to hold the worst to account and reprise the moral resolve that has led us through dark times in this country many, many times before. Too many have sacrificed too much for us to squander the opportunity before us, the opportunity to rise to the challenge of this moment, to set aside petty squabbles, the opportunity to build on the promise of limited government, economic freedom, and individual liberty, the promise that underpins the American dream. So the I, more I've power not, stuff. <laughs> I've yeah. not seen that in you know close to two years. Oh. Well, how do, uh, how do you feel, guy, how do you feel rewatching it? Like, do you feel like it all rings totally true today? Do you wish you'd hit any different points? Um, you know, it, it, those were the moments where I was still aggressively campaigning and, and petitioning and spending a lot of time on the Senate side uh, to get the Afghan Adjustment Act passed to try mm -hmm. to get that into the you know NDAA or into that omnibus that was being worked on, um, and you know because that was a, a deeply personal kind of issue and it was. Yeah something that we were so close to being able to get. Um, it, ironically enough, and it got zero attention, this that um, Afghan Adjustment Act, which you know, would offer some stability and kind of certainty for the folks that you know had supported U.S. forces in Afghanistan that we had evacuated, uh, some of whom you know were still in the process of, of kind of evacuate, evacuating and resettling uh, to give them you know some permanence as opposed to the, the kind of temporary status many of them are on. Um, and it's an, an unholy mess of, of a kind of bureaucratic conundrum they're in. Uh, and so that, that was, I would say, my, my kind of main focus. Um, you know, I don't know, and I hadn't even kind of thought about it. My, my campaign launch video hit a lot of those same themes, um, you know, despite, you know, I probably should have done some of my research and look back at, you know, those words, but, you know, were things I clearly and deeply believe and, and think are, you know, still very much ring true. Um, you know, I think if you don't have, you know, a, again, a good balance of power between the executive and the legislative branch, I think, well, if I can just kind of step back, there's a lot of folks who think our, our chaos in our system right now is, is a, a product of political chaos that because of how chaotic our politics are, you know, our government can't function. And that's what I thought going in today. I, I'm a big believer it gets the causality backwards that the more our government screws up, uh, that the more, you know, the American people feel the consequences of inept policymaking, uh, the more they reach for, you know, replacements, for alternatives, um, you know, for explanations for why that individual, when they got into office, couldn't do the things they promised to be able to do. Uh, so, you know, you, this guy didn't get the job done, so we're going to vote him out and send in somebody who's even more emphatic that they'll do it. Hmm. And so much of the challenge, though, is the power has been stripped from many of those offices in Congress. You know, either Congress has, has let the executive take it, has given it to the executive, or the executive is just, you know, taking that over. And so the basic kind of mechanical function of our government is broken. And that's where then, you know, you have that promotion of extreme, you know, and, and ever more chaotic politics. If there were fewer things the government was screwing up, you know, there'd always be people who are dissatisfied, but, you know, we'd find less purchase. You wouldn't be fertilizing the same ground, you know, that those kind of seeds of, of mistrust, um, you know, can be planted in. And so I'm, I think it's a, it's a complicated thing. So you start talking about legislative supremacy and, and notions of, of subsidiarity and, you know, gener generic concepts. Um, there, it's, challenging to get that done, not impossible, but challenging to get it done in Washington because so many, there's, uh, every legislator will look at a policy um, and want, need to see a very concrete upside because the downside is always theoretically exponential. You know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Or if it is broke, 
um, you know, try not to fix it because no matter what you do, if you get your fingerprints on it, you know, you, you might uh, be held to blame, even if your efforts were all well and good and pure of heart. And that's when I, you know, it's easy to kind of throw up your hands at that challenge. Um, but to me, the art of government is trying to say, okay, politics is the art of the possible. You know, how do you find ways in which you can make you know, a concrete lasting effort? It's a lot easier to do that if you're getting at some of the structures underpinning responses to issues than if you're just oh. getting distracted by the issues at hand. You need to deal with and react to those issues, but you also have to be able to get out of that reactive mindset to be able to put forward you know, a vision and also backwards plan. You know, how do you get from that vision? How do you get to that vision from where we are? You know, what is that pathway? Could you talk about that, the structural issue as it pertains to foreign policy and the balance of powers? Because I know it's something you have been very focused on. Um, that the what, something you raised there is an attempt to make Congress exercise its war powers and sort of rebalance between con uh, legislative and executive branches, which I think is extremely important uh, when we're talking about, about the federal government. What are you hoping to accomplish on that front to, uh, if you make it back to DC? Yeah, I, I think you need, I approach a lot of these with sort of a, a policy agnostic, but you know, process obsessive mindset. Um, you know, if you think about war powers, I think oftentimes it's you know, within the context of, oh, we need to end this war and that's why we need to repeal it. I, I mentioned the example of uh, the war on terror, you know, 2001 thereafter had that authorization for the use of military force that was passed shortly after 9-11, had that had a, a sunset every two years or, or four years or six years, um, probably six is too high, but you know, two years, three years, five years, something within that band, it's not necessarily saying that nothing would happen after that five-year period. You know, it's saying that there would have to be far more frequent engagement by the Department of Defense, you know, by the you know national security community with Congress. Uh, and Congress would because they have to cast a vote, you know, our senators and representatives would have to be casting an affirmative vote either in favor of continuing or uh, in opposition to continuing uh, military uh, you know, efforts. They would be asking better questions. They would feel more of a sense of ownership. They would have to articulate and defend. They would, but in the process of asking those more difficult questions, the Department of Defense would also have to sharpen its pencils. You know, our policymakers on the national security side would have to more firmly articulate and align their efforts with what they were saying. Right? This notion that if we're just going to be hands off, everything will be fine, I think is has become so detrimental and so ruinous because you have sort of a defense policy establishment that um, essentially looks at Congress as a body to avoid. I mean, I, there were a couple of times where I would we'd be getting a, a classified briefing and I would say, oh, my God, thank, thank God we're finally getting, you know, a briefing on on issue X. Uh, I've been waiting for a while. And then I turn around and realize, you know, it was sort of um, it was kind of like, a, you know, you realize they're trying to sell you a timeshare, you know, like it was, you know, yeah, we need your support on, you know, this bill or this authorization. And so we're telling you how big of a problem uh, is going on in this region. Not because you should be aware, not because it should be informing, you know, how you're approaching something, but because we're going to have to ask you for something. And so if the, yeah. if the executive had to ask Congress for more, the amount of transparency would be higher. The, the, the feeling of responsibility among members would be higher. And, you know, I think it, it things would just function better. Again, would that lead to less or more? Um, I think there's, there's arguments to be made in, in kind of either direction, but if we look at the strikes that you know the president has just conducted recently against the Houthis, against Iranian-backed groups in um, in Iraq, in Syria, you know both are are picking from a variety of different uh, you know authorizations coming from the Constitution, whether it's um, Article Two kind of defense powers of the president uh, in in a self-defense capacity, or you know article one authorities from authorizations through use of military force that were passed in 2001 or 2002. Again, it, it just is doing an end run. It is failing to engage. And I think it allows the American people to check out because their representatives are checked out. Um, and that type of lack of transparency, of, of lack of attention, of, of lack of concern, um, 
I think ultimately only dooms those projects to failure. Cause then when people start to do pay attention after something bad happens, you know, they catch themselves up on 20 years and in, in the span of a, you know, two minute TikTok video. And that's probably yeah. not going to be conveying an accurate. I reality. mean, I could, I could, I could tell from that speech that your experience serving overseas, you brought a certain, you, you had a, you were almost like personally insulted by the way that these wars have been conducted over the past couple of decades. Like wh what is it that th this sort of, I don't know, half uh, half hazard or just like rubber stamping type approach why is that particularly insulting and damaging to the people who serve in the military yeah, it just shows a disregard right i it, i think uh, you know I, I by way of background i was in iraq as a soldier doing intelligence operations in, in you know uh 2020 sorry 2010 and 2011 and then i was in afghanistan uh, as an NGO conflict analyst for the humanitarian aid community. So, you know, no uniform, no weapons, neutral living on the economy uh, from 2013 to 2015. And, you know, I think in both of those conflicts, we found ourselves with allies of convenience that just looked at the U.S. as an entity to exploit. Um, we didn't necessarily have any specific strategy or objective or, or goal we were going towards, uh, or if we did, it would change frequently enough that, you know, what we were doing was never aligned towards any specific intent. Um, you know, that notion of a self-licking ice cream cone. And the reality is that the entire time you're there, I mean, there's a risk that you're undertaking. American service members are dying. Um, you know, again, I don't reflexively say, oh, you got to bring everyone home or there's no scenario in which we should be in some of those areas. But it, our policymakers sure as hell need to articulate why those risks are being undertaken, to what end, you know, what are those terms? Um, and, and how often would those be reevaluated? Because I think the majority of the war on terror, or at least our kind of post 9-11 moment, has been, you know, this linear sense of engagement where it's like, okay, we're either going to maybe some sanctions, then we're going to have some airstrikes, maybe a special forces raid, uh, maybe, you know, the Marines will go in and be, you know, temporary, or maybe we're going to hold and build with kind of large conventional forces. And it's like, okay, well, to, to what end? What's our goal? Yeah. Yeah, and have our so. efforts helped achieve whatever that goal is. But you can't even measure if they've been effective if you don't have a consistent goal or you keep changing it. And again, lives hang in the balance. Civilian lives are lost. Military service members' lives are lost. And the taxpayer is footing the bill for all of that. Yeah, it's been catastrophic on so many different levels. Um, I, I, I do want to bring us to a couple uh, of your other policy, the, the other policy uh, priorities that you seem to have in this campaign. Uh, and to kick off a conversation about that, I've got, I did pull a couple clips from your campaign announcement that I think could give your viewers a sense of the issues you're running on. Uh, in this first one, you talk about the importance of babies, of making more babies. Let's roll that clip. I'm Peter Meyer, and I'm running for U.S. Senate. And I want to let you in on a secret. Most politicians are terrified of the media, of saying what they actually think, of proposing things that are big and bold. We should be making it easier for people to get married, buy a house, and just have more babies. My wife and I just had a son. And I can tell you, babies need to be the vision for our future. And when those babies go to school, parents should never have to worry if their children are guinea pigs in someone's social experiment. Parents deserve a say and choice. That's why we need a regime change in education. We need to expel the anti-Semites and activists who are poisoning young minds with hate. We need to hold universities accountable when they swindle students by hitting them and their tax-free endowments. So you're talking to a couple of young parents with young kids right now, and you know neither of us are voting in the Michigan Republican Senate primary, but we're in the age stage of life demo that you're kind of speaking to there. Um, what is why, why is making life better for parents top of mind for you? I mean, you can obviously look at our demographic issues that we're facing as a country, but a lot of this I just boil down to the simple question: um, How are what is our government doing to make the American dream within reach? What are they doing to you know further complicate things? And I will start off by saying the number one frustration I have is when every policymaker, your legislator, or politician reacts to a problem 
with you know a new set of legislation or a new law, as opposed to from the get go saying, what are we currently doing that is either helping or that is hurting? And if it's helping, maybe do more of it. If it's hurting, let's stop it. Because the easiest thing for the government to do is to stop doing things that are being, you know, uh, demonstrably, you know, uh, un ineffective or that are making the problem worse. That's a lot easier to do than proposing something new that's uncertain. You know, so in my mind, you know, when it comes down to our, our role as you know, policymakers, the role of our legislature, and specifically the role of our federal government, um, is to be able to get out of the way, you know, to resist that urge to always tinker and fiddle. You know, when when you look at our housing policy in particular, you know, that is where a thousand good intentions, you know, have been the individual brinks, bricks in a road that has led state straight to an unaffordable hell in our current market. Um, you know, that, that is geographically dependent, but all across the board, you know, that is a massive major strain. So you have more folks who are unable to afford to buy a home, you know, are kind of locked into renting, aren't building up, you know, a, a base of assets um, or postponing uh, having families for financial reasons. And I'm very skeptical of what the government can do in an affirmative sense. But starting with getting the government out of the way, I, I've yet to have anyone who's pushed back and said, oh, that won't work. You know, reducing the regulatory burden, making sure that, you know, uh, I mean, on the educational side, again, this is largely a, a sto state and local issue. But at the federal level, there are all of these strings attached. There are these compliance and, and reporting incentives that both raise costs, but also can be used to tweak in a way um, our education system away from sort of, again, demonstrable objective outcomes that we can come to an agreement on and turn something into uh, at an inflection around a, a socially benevolent or, or you know, a, a socially tinged policy uh, that, you know, you kind of wake up and look at that San Francisco school district that uh, gave a quarter million dollars of, of taxpayer funds to you know, quote unquote, woke kindergarten. And from a, just a parent standpoint, they step back and say, I, you know, maybe there's a conversation there that, you know, should have taken place with those parents, you know, but the idea of, of again, removing so much individual consent or individual notion from every single dynamic of a, a government that continues, I think oftentimes not in a malevolent way, but just out of a sense of, of, of hubris and arrogance to presume they know better and, and drive um, or incentivize outcomes that, again, stray from objective standards and into the realm of, you know, I called it in that kind of someone's social experiment. I, I'm very much in respect the libertarian non-aggression principle. You know, you should be very, very humble in understanding, you know, who can do what. Our technocrats need to be humble. Our government policymakers need to be very humble in appreciating what the unexpected outcomes of something may be. Because if you don't and you are are reckless and arrogant, you know, there's going to be a reckoning and that will be socially challenging. I don't mean reckoning in a um, in a sincere, like, you know, catastrophic sense, but we I'm from, have a Dutch background. I mean, reckoning um, in Dutch, de reckoning, that's the bill. You know, the bills come and do. Um, you know, we're yeah. going to have to pay for it one way or the other. So let's have some humility on the front end so we're not surprised on the back end. Well, so a few months ago, Reason ran a cover story by one of our colleagues um, that throws a little bit of cold water on the concerns about fertility rates. I think that this is an interesting area that we've actually engaged with a fair bit on this show because there's a lot of disagreement among libertarians. Um, libertarians tend to support, by and large, um, government being as values neutral as possible. Many libertarians support the removal of any sort of um, tax advantage uh, for married couples. Um, a lot of libertarians tend to basically say government needs to get out of the way and frankly, not be concerned with how people are living their lives or whether or not they're forming families or on what timeline. There are some libertarians, and I would probably count myself among them, that are a little bit more concerned about um, 
what our fertility rate looks like over time and whether or not we're going to be emulating Japan with their sort of graying population uh, and like inverted pyramid. How do you look at these thorny questions? Like how would you convince a, a skeptical libertarian or a libertarian who's antagonistic to your idea that baby making is important? What would you say to them if you had, you know, 30 or 60 seconds to make your case? Now, I would certainly agree that the government shouldn't be in the position of, of, of promoting a specific agenda. And again, that's where I come back to policymakers also being very humble because a lot of well-intentioned policies, um, especially in, in probably including in the pro-natalist camp, can lead to outcomes that are, are far from intended. Uh, mm -hmm. So a, again, boiling down to that affordability question, um, you don't achieve higher affordability uh, and the you don't achieve that through you know, um, subsidies that can have a, a temporary impact, but eventually mm -hmm. the market will adjust and it becomes a dependency. You get kind of Baumol's cost disease that will come into play very quickly. Uh, you know, the, the fact I would say is there are some things that I think are relatively objective social goods that if the government is maybe not in a position to be able to affirmatively promote or where they're promoting a policy could have negative effects, it should be doing everything it can to make sure that it is not uh, operating contrary to that social good. But why does it matter at all in the first place? Like, why does it matter that we have children running around and attending schools and on the playgrounds that we pass by versus, you know, a situation like Korea's or Japan's? Like, who cares? Oh, I mean, if, if you, anyone who's interested in the long-term fiscal sustainability of the U.S. should care. Anybody who wants, you know, the U.S. to continue to be a growing and, and thriving country should care. Um, you know, our, our social security system was set up when there were 2.1 workers, uh, sorry, um, you know, 14 workers for every retiree. And now the ratio is, is 2.1 to one. Mm -hmm. Like at some point the math just kind of runs out. Uh, I think, again, I, I, I'm very skeptical of the heavy handed role of the government, what it could do um, in, in terms of affirming those policies. And where I say the number one thing is if we agree that this is good, we should be able to agree that the government shouldn't be doing anything to prevent that. So the more yeah. we peel back those layers, to me, that should be a place where you can reach both bipartisan consensus and where it's aligned with just general limited government principles. I find myself generally uh, torn on this issue. So I definitely appreciate uh, the ability to, in a sense, play devil's advocate and uh, promote the libertarian side that's maybe more antagonistic to your thesis, though, I mean, I have a 16 month old, right? Like I am extremely soft on the issue of babies and think that we should probably all have as many of them as possible. Uh, Zach, you were going to jump in. Well, oh, there's just one other policy issue I wanted to touch on with you. Something that jumped, one other thing that jumped out to me from that ad, which is an issue that's very important to Michigan voters, I presume, uh, where you're talking about manufacturing and competition with China. So let's roll that clip. Do you know that China is graduating 10 engineers for every American engineer? This is not a time where we can afford to play nice. I'm a free market guy. But if corporations want favors from our government, then they better be investing here. If we're going to have to pay for electric cars, then we better be building them in Michigan, not Mexico. And we should be using supply chains that are American, not Chinese. So what I heard there was, I'm a free market guy, but, but what, Peter? But what? Yeah. Uh, what could, could you just explain that uh, a little bit further for us? Yeah, no, I mean, the reality of our current economic climate is, you know, we are we are free market with a heavy asterisk around so many different areas where, you know, either from, uh, you know, heavy handed federal policy or, or regulatory job owning or, you know, just objective pieces of legislation that have been passed. You know, Washington is picking winners and losers. We are making determinations. Uh, plenty of companies come to DC for handouts. The ideal world is to peel that back and to get away from it. If we have this world and I want to deal with the world as we have it, I would like to see us get to a world uh, where we do have, you know, far less 
uh, federal policies that are creating a more challenging business environment, especially those that are not readily defensible on grounds of, of safety or, um, or you know, just objective environmental components, but are around more nebulous, you know, goals, um, you know, strings attached to dollars that, again, then distort what should be a very simple profit or loss, you know, business equation and become one where there are, you know, um, you know, regulatory capture of a, a sector uh, where, as we see in, in my state of Michigan right now, we have made so many parts of our state regulatory apparatus burdensome that the only companies who are coming here are those that were forking over hundreds of millions of dollars to um, incentivize them to come. And at that point, they're, you know, they're oftentimes only the companies that don't want to locate or won't be received well anywhere else. So many of them end up having, um, you know, uh, a Chinese economic ties. So I think this this is where untangling that web is essential. But where we have that web, um, having some very clear understandings of of what is our where are we opening up liabilities with our dependence on Chinese supply chains? I'm certainly not somebody who has any issue if our pool floaties are made in China, but you know if the majority of our prescription pharmaceuticals are coming from outside the country and in the event of you know a disruption to global trade or international shipping or anything we saw along the lines of COVID, now we're in real trouble. Right? I think it's about reducing those vulnerabilities, appreciating those vulnerabilities, and not just having a reflexive, um, what I think we've seen all too often, a reflexive notion and, and even incorporated into American policy that ends up hurting our own ability. We can go from buy American policies to the Jones Act to a handful of other places where you can just align what the stated intent of the policy was and demonstrably show that the policy is not reaching it. And there's an incuriosity legislatively to address it. Um, you know, that worries me. And that's where I'm highly suspect of affirmative policies. But when we're looking at how our system is being managed at the moment, being very clear that we should not be permitting or accepting, you know, uh, you know, taxpayer dollars that if they that maybe shouldn't be going there in the first place. But if they are, uh, then those should be focused domestically. If I we have these policies, then we should be promoted in such a way that is doing minimal damage while we still have them. I think you win the reason drinking game. Um, Every time Jones Act is brought up, we all have to take a shot. This is like a huge uh, pet issue of pretty much everybody on staff at Reason over here. And I think it's a little bit of this uh, libertarian uh, bat signal that we sort of give out to each other. But but again, just connect a policy with an outcome, right? Yeah, if, if, absolutely. If the intent was to support the domestic maritime you know, uh, industry and specifically the construction industry, then why do we have the lowest tonnage, you know, of, of ships built in the U.S. than you know we've had in over a century, right? So, uh, I'm, yeah, <laughs> I agree with so, you completely. You know, you you know, you're you're known as one of the few Republicans who voted to impeach Trump for his behavior on January sixth. In fact, this is the way that the New York Times is characterizing your Senate run. Peter Meyer, a Republican who voted to impeach Trump, is running for Senate. Um, you know, uh, given what the GOP has become, mm -hmm. though, the, we've seen this glide path to the nomination that Trump is on. How big a problem is that for you in terms of being viable in a Republican primary? I, I frankly don't think it's much of a problem. Um, I think there's, I was just having this conversation earlier, there's an interesting dynamic where from and I'm not labeling reason as sort of media, quote unquote, you are obviously a media organization, but in like the broader media narrative, everything can be reduced down to these, um, you know, these kind of polar dynamics, right? You're either you're pro or anti, you're on one side or the other. Um, you know, I never, you know, called myself somebody who was you know, anti-Trump or, or never Trump. Um, I took serious issue uh, up to and including obviously voting to impeach uh, the former president for his actions on January 6th. Um, I thought that that was you know, worthy of both uh, condemnation and also worthy of a adjudication in the Senate um, because that was a dark and shameful day and the American people deserve to hear uh, you know, the facts presented and for the president and uh, then former president to make his case. Um, you know, the reality, I think, of so, well, the reality that escapes so much of our politics 
and and where it becomes challenging is you know i don't accept that you have to be all one thing or all the other that you know you're in either the the, the black box over here or the white box over here um i try to call balls and strikes i try to be as honest a broker as i can of not excusing something that i would have condemned had it been uh somebody of the opposite party doing and i think that's something i grew up you know despising politicians for watching john stewart back when he was actually funny and seeing you know him playing clips of a uh, of a member of congress arguing against you know the two year prior version of themselves on the same issue uh, with the only difference being you know who was the president and they supported it when their guy did it and they opposed it when the other guys you know other person's guy did it i think that leads to the cynicism we have and so that's who i try not to be i try to have that consistent approach try to call balls and strikes be an honest broker and you know at the end of the day i can honestly say i would vastly uh prefer even you know maybe my least favorite republican candidate uh, to a second Joe Biden administration. Um, yeah. Why were so many of your colleagues such cowards when it comes to the impeachment vote? I, there were certainly plenty of folks who had, um, what I would say are, are kind of sincere and, and reasonable objections. A uh, vast majority of folks will just, and this is not, um, you know, this is not limited to to that vote on almost everything. It would say, well, you know, there's safety in numbers. Where's everybody else going? I'll just follow suit. Um, but to me, I, that's right. just the definition of like moral cowardice, right? Like when push comes to shove, they're not willing to actually be leaders in any way and say and 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 assess the evidence in front of them and say, you know, a lot of uh, the stolen election claims are fairly bogus. They can be adjudicated via the court system. In many way, in many cases, they ultimately were, and judges consistently ruled that they were um, not very credible. And the actual actions that people took on January sixth were um, pretty abominable. Uh, really, an attempt to impede the ability to appropriately register, you know, people's political preferences. I'm sorry, but like, I, I just am I missing anything? Or is that a pretty clear cut situation where there's just an extraordinary moral cowardice problem among Republicans right now? Oh, I mean, the, you never, I mean, the, the sort of line is you never have to explain why you voted no on something. But, <laughs> you know, if you vote yes, somebody will always find something to take fault. You know, again, I, I had some colleagues who, um, you know, would, would agree with everything you said, but would say, well, I, you know, they read the article of impeachment and they, were uncomfortable that it was alleging a criminal action. Again, not a criminal process, but that it didn't have a kind of broader dereliction of duty. There were actually Republicans who were trying to work with Nancy Pelosi on having a more limited article um, who had committed to voting in favor of it, but she said, no, we're going with what we drafted uh, because her goal was to have as few Republicans um, in support as possible. Uh, it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to save a lot of that for, for a memoir, but I mean, the reality is, and again, the way I look at things, um, change the party, you know, change the person who's doing it from somebody who's you know on my side to oppose or somebody who's opposed to me to being on my side. If that changes how I view the action, then mm -hmm. my ethics are clearly only situational and, and I should find something that I can be consistent about. You know, there's going to be votes that are shirts and skins, right? There's going to be things that, you know, what is a sticking point to you in the minority you might be comfortable with if you're in the majority or, or vice versa. Um, but the, the sort of just reflexive uh, approach where it doesn't seem like anybody actually believes anything. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't abide that. I don't like that. I saw plenty of it. It disgusted me. I enjoyed quietly being like, now, now you voted this way in the you know effort to hold uh, you know, Eric Holder in contempt, but uh, how how are you making the distinction between this? And, um, and to some of my colleagues' credit, they would say, okay, honestly, like I can find, you know, two or three distinctions, but I don't really believe in it. Like it, some of this just comes down to shirts and skins. But so I don't want party... to glide over the uh, what you said earlier, which is that you say that you would support even your you know most disliked Republican over the you know a second Just Joe Biden favorite. term. 
least favorite. your least favorite Republican. Um, so uh, we can possibly put Donald Trump into that category. Uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but um, what? Why is that? You know, given your sincere kind of principled and moral objections to what went down around the election, what happened? You know, the behavior on January sixth and post January 6th and just these ongoing legal cases hanging over his head. What is it that, you know, still makes that more appealing than a second Biden term? No, I, mean, I would say to me, the, the two most pivotal days in my time in Congress were, you know, January 6th of 2021 and August 15th of 2021 when Afghanistan collapsed. Um, and my, you know, both were moments where I a lot of, of folks that I had thought better of or systems I had thought, uh, you know, had some competency, you know, were really shown um, the shine was totally off, you know, both of those respective apples, um, you know, one on the domestic political side, the other, you know, and our, our kind of incompetency of our national security apparatus um, and the unwillingness of, of a lot of people to um, you know, gauge and, and react to appropriate risks. When, but is it fair to lay the disaster of the Afghanistan withdrawal completely at Biden's feet? I mean, there was a wasn't there a certain inevitability that you know was, yeah, if never, we were to pull back, there was going to be a collapse of the government there. And I want to be very clear. Um, you know, I think there was there was a we could spend an hour on this, the, the, my specific way in which I felt, um, you know, very much betrayed and felt like that was sort of a, a betrayal by proxy of a lot of the folks who, had, you know, hinged, um, on us when Biden announced that he was going to withdraw, you know, by then said September 11th, and then it was moved up to September 1st. Um, that was in April of 2021. Um, and I was supportive of that. I was supportive of Trump's effort to withdraw. We immediately had a bipartisan group of us working in Congress saying, OK, we still got a lot of folks who supported us, this special immigrant visa program. What can we do to, you know, now that we have a, a time frame, now that we have sort of a final clock, I should light a bit of a fire to, to go and process all of this. Uh, it was roadblock after roadblock. Um, those flights only started leaving. Um, I think the first one was on July 29th uh, and, and it was 200 people a day, um, not every day. And then within two weeks, the entire you know kind of country collapsed, and we were left with the mass evacuation that we had. Um, we, when I say we encountered roadblock after roadblock, some of it was just bureaucratic incompetency, making sure everything goes through the interagency process, yada yada yada. Uh, and there was also, I think, a, a great fear on behalf of the Biden administration that the evacuation of, of you know Afghans, which was supported in a bipartisan way, this was very much not a controversial issue, um, you know that that would end up getting compared or draw light to the problems that we were having on the southern border, which even at that time, the Biden administration was aware of and were paranoid of, of that becoming a larger media focus because they thought it would be so you know, politically damaging to them or, or raise uncomfortable questions. Now, you know, that fear um, that led to basically the you know, evacuation of, of Afghans who had supported the United States forces that we had a commitment to, um, <laughs> that ultimately was really the inflection point that tanked his approval rating. Uh, and so I, I both have, you know, a deep feeling of kind of personal betrayal um, from that. Um, and, and just, it's still kind of a, a knife in my gut that I still feel is very sharp uh, it, combined with my overall long-term view of, well, what is going to be better for the country? I think that overall where the root of so much social chaos and disorder is going to come from, um, it, what will be the number one exacerbating factor that will certainly be capitalized to expand the size, scale, and scope of federal government to turn a ratchet in ways that we can't ratchet back is if we encounter significant and severe and persistent economic uncertainty and unrest. That will make everything worse. I think the that's where I come down and, to. And I'm, Biden I'm a, is more Biden. likely to deliver that in your opinion. I, I mean, I, I would be very open to someone making the counter argument. Um, you know, when I, what I saw in Congress in terms of the administration ramming through policies that even some of my democratic colleagues knew would be economically harmful, but they didn't yeah. feel like they could stop or, or have a voice to say no. Um, 
the the insane like post COVID spending um, bills. Yeah, no, I mean the American Rescue Plan was probably I think the consensus estimates um, at least three to four points or sorry, at least two and a half to three points of the inflation that we saw could be solely attributed to the 1.9 trillion coming out of that. We're always going to have some inflation just with COVID. Um, you know, I think there were some well-intended policies that, you know, I'm willing to give the benefit of the doubt on. And then when you're passing policies, when there's very clearly no economic imperative to do so, um, and it's just all sort of a partisan grab bag, uh, you know, that, that buck stops at the president's office, but the broader, challenge and, and issue that we have, I mentioned sort of legislative supremacy, you know, our executive branch is far too powerful. The fact that, you know, we feel like if you elect the wrong president, the country is going to, you know, take a nosedive. A lot of that problem is because of the office. I think the office of the president is one of the most dangerous institutions in the Western world right now, because of how much power, um, both through Supreme Court decisions and through, you know, uh, legislative ineptitude, incompetence, or um, inattention has ultimately accrued into that office. And that has, that to me is far more important than who the individual office holder is and what their policies are. I sincerely appreciate the argument that you're making and the pragmatism that you're talking about with regard to, you know, how Joe Biden has actively made the inflationary situation so much worse in a way that harms people's budgets. And then that um, incubates a certain amount of, you know, political unrest uh, that stems from that. I, I, I'm very sympathetic to all of that, but I'm still struggling with this fundamental idea that, you know, if push came to shove, you would feel more comfortable supporting Trump uh, than Biden uh, in seeking another term. I mean, are you concerned about Trump's co-opting of the Republican, the, de the degree to which the Republican Party has been totally co-opted um, and corrupted under Trump, as well as, you know, I mean, you have been such an ardent voice against a lot of the election conspiracy theory stuff. Um, how do we know that that's not going to get worse in a way that fundamentally threatens American democracy and our institutions? Yeah, I mean, and, and this is where I always try to be you know, understand, you know, okay, well, what, let, let me try to have a consistent standard again, that, that notion of being consistent, understanding the components and depths of a problem, you know, the numbers of democratic voters who viewed the 2016 election as illegitimate were the mirror image of Republican voters who viewed 2020 as illegitimate. Um, that doesn't excuse, you know, Republicans doing that. And obviously the post 2020 election period was dramatically different than the post, you know, 2016 election period. But to me, it says this is a, the, the problem that's underlying this is more widespread, right? The violence on January 6th and the violence that we saw over the summer of 2020, again, neither excuses or, or should allow anyone to condone one while condemning the other. I think both are worthy of condemnation and, you know, both may have degrees of difference in various attributes, but the common thread is it was a, a large group of people expressing a frustration that they felt could not be resolved within the system. So they engaged in activities that were, you know, attacking the system from without rather than working from within. So again, my broader view is while not, you know, condoning, um, you know, either is to say, well, let's look at what is underpinning some of this. What is the problem beneath the problem? Because that, if we don't address it, if we don't get at some of those issues of institutional trust, if we don't have you know, a, a government that feels like it is representing everybody, that there are minimal incompetent moments that are going to be highlighted because with social media and the internet it is a lot easier to highlight them. If we reduce the amount of times where someone looks at the government and says, what are these, um, trying to swear less, but, you know, insert your profanity of choice guys doing, then maybe we can get to the point where that temperature is, is kind of boiled down. The challenge is, you know, from one partisan position to the other, it's, well, let me condemn all the things that I can on the other side and then find convenient ways of rationalizing my own. So that's yeah, why I think that's, yeah, I, I think that's I, a, it's a really, it's a really important point um, that there's a lot of the, the degradation of the norms and the institutions 
is coming from the other side and it happens in a more perhaps more subtle way than you know trump's blatant uh claims of election fraud and conspiracy like like one one thing i'm, I'm continually fascinated and horrified by is the extent to which democrats and some of the hardcore anti-trump republicans who constantly sermonize about how our hallowed, hallowed democracy is in trouble if the MAGA movement gains ground, are actually willing to prop up MAGA candidates. Uh, in fact, you know, we know from the that WikiLeaks happened? email, yeah, I know it happened to you, and I want to talk about that in a second, but like on, on the biggest scale it happened, the, the WikiLeaks dump showed that that was a strategy of the Hillary Clinton campaign to push as much media attention as they could towards Trump. They called it the Pied Piper strategy. And yeah, it happened in your election race. Let me just pull up the uh, New York Times article on it. Uh, Democrats aid far-right candidate against Republican who backed impeachment, that being you. Um, and they note that $425,000 of advertising uh, went uh, from Democratic groups went to your uh, uh, basically, it was a an ad that uh, was kind of pretending to attack your opponent, but really was just like highlighting all the attributes that would be uh, appealing to a hardcore conservative. So it's this kind of like sneaky advertising in favor of your opponent because they thought he would be easier to beat in the general and it turned out they did beat him in the general. So their political calculation might have been right, but the, the moral calculation is what's more troubling and interesting to me and what I'd like you to comment on. Yeah. And I mean, to me, and just for the record, so I lost by my primary by three points. It was not exactly, you know, a blowout. Um, you know, ultimately I, I take responsibility for that loss, but you know, it was, I thought it was very rich the way that, you know, I, I would hear the Democrats rail against, you know, what a threat these guys are and, you know, at the same time doing everything to boost. Right. And, and that's where I am very much a kind of pox on all houses mentality. I think it's um, there's a sort of I think both sides in something gets a bum rap because it's often, well, it's fine if we do this because they do it, too. And my point is, no, like. Everyone here has has some blood on their hands in terms of producing the moment that we're in. Um, there may be degrees of difference in terms of who's done more in this case or more in that case, uh, but ultimately both parties and, and all folks are, are living in glass houses on this. So just, you know, as a Republican, I want to be able to condemn when you know, mobs try to intimidate lawmakers. And that can become a hard thing if I spent the whole time condoning or making excuses for, um, you know, January 6th, right? Like, because consistency matters to me. And, and that's not going to say that I'm, you know, I, there aren't places where I look back and say, oh, well, I probably should have done this. Or how do I find that thread? You know, I'm not going to pretend to be perfect in that, but that is my aspiration. That is my goal. And that stands in contrast to a, a political system who's, I mean, the amount of times I've seen the post and I've or somebody's comment and I'm like, I cannot tell sincerely if you are being sarcastic or not, because I could I could f find the rationalization for, you know, a sincere interpretation of this tweet or for it yeah. to be entirely tongue in cheek because, you know. I, <laughs> like It's all unmoored. Right. And and again, getting back to the beginning of this conversation, that feeling of like, um you know, what actually matters, who actually believes something, where, where are we actually going? Or are we just, you know, all these whirling dervishes, you know, spinning around and, and staying in the same place? Um, I would just like to be able to uh, affirmatively, you know, out or have, you know, government officials, you know, folks making policy, affirmatively outlining a position and consistently defending it, as opposed to, you know, well, you're going to forget about what I said last week. So I'm just going to, you know, adopt whatever the flavor of the day is um, because, you know, or again, our attention spans may not be long enough for anyone to recall it. And anybody who points out that inconsistency, you know, I'll just call them a nerd and, and somebody who, you know, is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're explaining you're losing or whatever and, and just drive forward. Uh, it's, 
I'm sure there's some happy topics we can we can kind of wrap up on, but but that that broader trend and and you know this week and the Supreme Court there'll be the uh, the case about whether or not Donald Trump can be thrown off the Colorado states the Colorado ballot the main ballot Fourteenth Amendment um, argument that we've covered a little bit before on this show yeah no and and I mean the the thing I just I want to grab some of the folks who are advocating for this and saying like well um, so what would you what would your defense be if that same argument was applied to you? You know, and it's always, right. this is different or, or Trump is unique or, or X or Y or Z. It's like, okay, but um, you know, that's a value judgment. You're, you're saying that you're setting a precedent. How would you like it if yeah. that was you know used against you or what, what would you say? And if you would scream bloody murder, if somebody would do to you what you're doing to them, you know, I mean, every kindergartner is taught the concept of like the golden rule and doing unto others, you know, but within our political process, you know, it just becomes a, you know, um, you know, uh, might and right, you know, if you have the power, then you have the power to use it. And that's all well and good, but eventually you're going to be in the minority and, you know, you're going to get good and hard, whatever you gave to somebody else. And I think the challenge is, you know, if you don't have folks who are thinking of that long term, if they're not thinking past the end of the month or the year or this election cycle, you know, then there's no inherent disciplining mechanism to say, well, maybe don't pick up the thing that's just lying right in front of you um, because, you know, of what that effect will be on our broader system. But when you don't have individuals who care about that, when, you know, everything is short-sighted and, well, you know, if you're run out of town, run out of DC on a rail, you can always pick up a nice, you know, kind of cable network gig uh, or, you know, start your own company selling, you know, Sandra Day O'Connor bobbleheads or, you know, uh, you know, beat pills. Yeah, that's going to be, a, a very different incentive structure than that oriented towards, you know, thoughtful long-term governing. When you first learned about Democrats backing uh, and supporting, um, you know, the person who was trying to primary you and was ultimately successful in doing that, um, who was very far to the right of you, when you first learned about that, A, did you feel like a conspiracy theorist? Like, did that feel too crazy to be true? And B, like, how did you process that? What did that feel like in that moment? I mean, I wasn't surprised. I, they, yeah. um, I was surprised that it came through the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. That was actually their first independent expenditure of the 2022 midterms. It's uh, pretty blatant, right? Like they're not even trying to hide it. It, it didn't come through some, you know, kind of, you know, Shadowy group. Yeah. you know, thing. Like it, it was, it was blunt, uh, paid for by DCCC. Um, and I have my own conspiracy theory behind that, that they make it blunt to basically send the bat signal to, you know, democratic mm -hmm. voters in the district to say, Hey, you know, there's really no competitive democratic primaries. You can vote in either. Now, I, mm -hmm. I don't think that had a, a large impact, but you know, yeah, it, you know, I think I called it sanctimonious bullshit on, uh, um, on, you know, CNN of just like, again, like, what do you actually believe? And and what you believe, you know, be willing to be held consistent to it. So it, I should put it this way, very few things that happened while I was in Congress came as a surprise to me in terms of me just objectively being like, I can't believe this is happening. So many times where I would look at, you know, the, you know, possible kind of decision trees and events. And I was like, you know, what is probably the least inspiring or the dumbest or the, um, the outcome that would make me say, yeah, that feels about right. That ended up being the outcome nine times out of 10. So a, a lot of my worst assumptions or worst predictions, um, or just, you know, most, uh, my, my lowest estimation assumptions ended up being affirmed, uh, but I was rarely surprised. You know, it's, it's still, it's still happening. And you, it, that's probably the, the right approach is to just as, assume the, you know, adopt a sort of uh, strategic cynicism because you, you will be proven right when it comes to electoral politics at this level. Like the, the, the latest example of that that struck me was our colleague Matt Welch uh, wrote an article about uh, kind of the third party challenges that are likely to appear this cycle between RFK and the Libertarian Party and uh, the No Labels group. Uh, th there's very likely going to be a, a sizable percentage of voters um, that are that are voting for neither Trump or Biden, possibly you know covering the spread, and that's got these. 
<laughs> that's got the Democratic Party and probably the Republican Party too panicked, and their surrogates are engaging in these kinds of behaviors. They're trying to, uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, he uh, Matt describes uh, a, a vicious level of interest in the the no labels party. There's these tactics that third party watchers are very uh, familiar with, you know, uh, denying ballot access, engaging in lawfare, the normal, you know, uh, routes of of political uh, uh, running uh, political ads. Um, so it is more of this like kind of undermining democracy to supposedly protect democracy. Um, I'm, I'm reading a book right now at, that was recommended by one of our listeners by Emily Finley about this concept she calls democratism, where which is more of a romanticized version of democracy that isn't just a mechanism for selecting political leaders, but is actually an ideology that leads to certain social outcomes. So I, I guess my, my question for you is, is there any antidote to that kind of establishmentarianism that that uh do you think that first of all i guess do you think that's real and b can it be contained are there any methods to counteract that no i mean I, to me the the strongest method is is having having trusted objective folks who can look at a situation and just say okay you know, Democrats are railing about about uh, gerrymandering and how, you know, it's, you know, the Republicans are being evil down in Texas. So defend what you guys are doing in Illinois, defending what you're doing in New York. I, I, I think it, it needs to be called out. It needs to be pointed out. Um, you know, I it cracks me up the amount of times where, again, um, everything is the most important. This time is different. You know, we, we uh uh, we need to throw the rules out the window um, up and until the time where we want those rules back because they protect us. Like up and until the next time is even worse. And now trust us now. I mean, if you look at the way in which um, you know, President Biden, every single time he wants to blame Republicans for something, it's always MAGA Republicans. It's always extreme MAGA Republicans. It could be, you know, Susan Collins and Mitt Romney, you know, and they are, you know, extreme MAGA Republicans. Um, and I think that is certainly not helpful. Um, it undercuts whatever argument. And I think just drives us back into a, a, a cynical polarization where, mm. you know, you don't feel like you're going to have a home, but boy, is it more comfortable to, you know, at least be in one shelter or the other than in the middle in the wilderness or. Yeah. You know, I, like, I mean, it harkens back to the, your farewell speech where you're uh, qu quoting Yates and saying like the center is you know having trouble holding under those conditions i guess to to wrap us up maybe you could give us an optimistic vision for uh, escape from that like what is your vision of a gop and a, maybe even we'll a democratic GOP. party <laughs> that uh is looks different from how it does right now like what what is the the gop that Peter Meyer would like to see take us into, you know, really starting a, a new uh, American century. Yeah. I mean, to me, that party is one where you can look at a Republican run city. You can look at a Republican run state and say, gosh, that kind of seems like a place I want to live, right? Where folks are moving and voting with their feet. Um, you know, they're already doing that with the amount of outflows from California to Florida is telling, you know, but having more opportunities to see policies in action. So we remove the, the, the rhetorical, you know, dependence on, on who can make an argument and get to, well, what has been demonstrated to work, right? I think by grounding um, our, our policy discussions within communities, focusing on those outcomes, you know, it, it improves trust, it improves confidence when you have subsidiarity, right? You have lower levels of governance that folks can get engaged with. Then they feel they have a voice. Then they don't mm -hmm. feel like what is happening is something happening to them, but something that they are a part of that is, it is a government of, by, and for the people. But that requires the right structure. That requires the right setup. It requires, you know, conservatives getting back to a, a fundamental idea of conserving the values of the founding and conserving 
the principles of the Constitution, right? I think it's behind a lot of the fears, a lot of the frustrations, and a lot of the anger on the Republican Party today. But it's all about giving it a direction. You know, that rocket fuel uh, can take you to the moon with the right nozzle, or you can blow up on the launch pad. Um, and so, you know, we have the fuel, we need the nozzle, and we can go far. Peter Meyer, thank you very much for talking with us today. I appreciate the time. This has been fun. Yeah, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.